Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to give uh, the presentation today. It's a great pleasure for me um, to be here and, uh, and talk to you about that, what we are doing at uh, TRI in terms of uh, learning and particular supervised and self-supervised learning and uh, what our approach is to actually build uh, robust perception systems for automated driving. Before I dive into that, I want to uh, briefly talk a little bit about uh, TRI. Um, TRI is uh, the Toyota Research Institute was actually established in uh, beginning or at beginning of 2016 um, with uh, three different facilities in uh, Los Altos, Ann Arbor, and uh, in Cambridge. Uh, we are approximately 320 employees with a substantial budget, as you can see, and uh, we focus on on four different areas, which is uh, automated driving robotics, uh, advanced material design and discovery, and machine-assisted uh, cognition. We also work closely together with other uh, Toyota companies. So the, the vision of, of TRI is actually to transform the human condition in three aspects. Uh, the first one is uh, regarding safety um, that relates to uh, aut automated driving or more specifically to driver assistance systems where we are interested in building that what we call the guardian, which is uh, a system that prevents cars from being involved in an accident. And that what we are basically trying to do there is uh, to build the uncrashable car. And um, so that, that is the, the safety aspect or in more technical terms, that is um, future safety assistance. At the same time, we are working on uh, advanced mobility and providing access uh, for people. Um, the, and this is basically the so-called chauffeur application where it's a uh, mobility as a service um, application where we are aiming at building an autonomous or an automated driving vehicle. And the third uh, aspect is uh, improving quality of life. And there we are targeting, targeting particularly the elderly population um, by assisting them with, for example, robots in their homes and uh, assisting elderly people uh, in everyday um, tasks with uh, mobile manipulation robots. The, um, when it comes to automated driving, um, we are following the so-called one system, two modes approach. So you might uh, have already asked yourself, what does it mean that we are working at the same time on um, on the chauffeur application and the guardian application. And this slide briefly explains how this uh, fit basically fits together. So the concept of the chauffeur basically is to um, develop a fully autonomous driving system that is engaged at all times. And with the long-term goal as, uh, of having like shared mobility fleets or mobility as a service as an application. Um, the guardian on the other hand is the um, is the advanced or future driver assistance system um, that where the driver is always engaged and the vehicle monitors and intervenes to help uh, prevent collisions. So um, it is built on a similar hardware and software as well um, as, as the fully autonomous chauffeur, but it actually is more kind of like a monitoring system that uh, reasons about what itself would do and as to whether, for example, there's an, say, a safe exit path uh, at any point in time. So uh, this is basically the, the approach that we are um, going after. And the question is like, are, are there any synergies? And we'll come to, to this in, in, a, in a second. But be, before we start, like everyone working in this domain is typically getting asked about uh, uh, when we finally will have uh, self-driving cars. And uh, to basically give an answer upfront to that question, I wanna, uh, quote uh, a colleague of all of us, uh, Edwin Olson, uh, who actually worked in former days for Toyota Research, uh, who came up with this uh, thought about uh, Moore's law for self-driving vehicles, which is basically that question of uh, how many miles does it take between disengagements? And when we look at the numbers, then we see that uh, it 
thus far, th this measure doubles every 16 months. And uh, if you go for a logarithmic scale and plot this, right, this is years, this is miles between uh, disengagement, and we look at the human performance, which is this uh, horizontal line, then uh, the cars, if we stick with this growth rate, so to say, um, then it will actually from the time from the point where we are right now will actually take 16 years to reach human level performance as to whether the re human level performance is going to be enough to have autonomous cars and there's even debates about that uh, cars should be more performant autonom uh, autonomous cars should be more performant than humans then uh, that would actually take even longer so uh, given that measure it will be 2035 until we finally have that so what are approaches to actually achieve this? And uh, I mean, that's, uh, from that we see that this is, uh, that we still have a long way to go. Um, and uh, the first one, definitely the, the, the first approach could be, we call this a software engineer uh, who basically says, let's program everything. Uh, that obviously we cannot program everything. For example, like maps are hard to program. They actually typically need to learn. There's also map augmentation and uh, um, the map operations teams in, in all these uh, self-driving car companies, but uh, to a large extent that has to be acquired automatically from data. So that also doesn't really scale this approach simply because uh, not, not everything can be pro programmed. And furthermore, like the software engineers cannot foresee every, um, every problem that the car might encounter during its autonomous life. On the other hand, we might have the scientist, uh, the enthusiast that uh, thinks, uh, oh, let's just learn everything. And uh, obviously this also is limited simply because we do not have examples for everything. And the first, the car first needs to encounter uh, basically everything in order to being able to learn it. One answer to that could be simulation uh, that uh, we all know that um, this also is tedious to program all potential problems or corner cases in simulation and uh, having a high fidelity simulator is um, a, a task on its own. Then there might be the um, software, the machine learning engineer um, that who basically says, uh, then let's label everything. And um, the question there is like, how do we get the labels? And we all know that getting labels is A, tedious and B, extremely expensive. So here's just one example of a, uh, short snippet that we recorded with one of our vehicles in uh, in Odaiba close to Tokyo where you can see a typical um, then like daily life scene and from that you can imagine that uh, labeling such scenes in every frame in every camera in even the 3D LiDAR data uh, might be uh, an extremely uh, expensive and tedious job to do in order to basically follow that approach. Then uh, the Toyota approach actually is um, to basically learn from everyone. And um, the advantage that Toyota has in this context, um, and uh, I will explain this in a little bit more in uh, throughout this talk as well, is that uh, Toyota actually has millions of cars uh, on the road in um, virtually like every country. Um, there are cars that are equipped with sensors and the idea of TRI is to basically utilize the, the data coming from these cars to um, learn how people drive and to learn from that uh, how, to actually, um, how to actually drive. That comes with several questions that need to be answered. So first of all, we, we're going to have an enormous amount of, of data, which we not, cannot process at all. Um, in, in its uh, entirety. So, um, so what we actually need to do is we need to be selective. We need to actually have active processes for active data selection and so on. And then we also cannot label all these data. So we need to have uh, the ability to work with unlabeled uh, structured data in this context. And uh, so what we want to do is we basically want to drink from that uh, data fire hose and uh, utilize all the data that uh, come back um, from these cars. And just to give you an idea, so uh, like the Toyota cars cover basically all US roads uh, in under a day uh, distance wise. Right? So uh, just to give you an idea how much uh, data we might uh, acquire. 
So uh, in this talk, I'm going to um, focus on three different problems uh, in this context. Um, the first one is about self-supervised depth uh, learning. The next one will be uh, real-time panoptic segmentation. And finally, uh, recent work uh, that we call pillar flow uh, for object tracking. And that is uh, the three topics that I'm going to address in this talk. And in each of them, I will briefly also talk about how we are planning to do this uh, in an unsupervised or self-supervised fashion. I most, but the, the strongest one in that direction is the first one. And this is why I will spend most of the time uh, on that, namely the question of how we can actually learn depth from cameras in a self-supervised uh, fashion. And uh, that goes back to uh, basically two papers, uh, one published uh, last year at ICRA 2019, and the other one this year at, at CVPR, actually an uh, oral presentation. So what is the general idea behind this? As I mentioned, like Toyota has plenty of cars, millions of cars in the world, and the modern ones are equipped with so-called uh, safety senses. And uh, the Toyota Safety Sense 2.0, for example, all the, also already has a camera pointing forward. And the question now is, like, is there a way to utilize this camera in, in a way that we right now utilize LIDARs, uh, for example, for depth estimation? Um, and is there also a way for doing this in an unsupervised fashion? And uh, we all know LIDARs are expensive, and um, which makes it extremely attractive, and cameras are cheap. So if we can like, turn a camera into a LIDAR, uh, some people call this VIDAR, then uh, we are actually um, in a situation where we do have a competitive uh, sensor, uh, not only quality-wise, but also uh, price-wise. So monocular depth estimation basically is the problem of assigning a depth value to every pixel. Um, and um, the idea of this work is to use that what we call a monodepth network that basically takes an arbitrary image and um, like tells for every pixel how far this is away um, from the camera. The, um, the idea there of supervised learning um, is basically to take the raw data um, and have some model, like a deep network, uh, that is able to make predictions. Right? And then the way you learn these models is you come up with a loss function that in the supervised way is uh, given by target values or labels, and then uh, basically compare um, the, these labels to the predictions, and um, you do a gradient descent in the loss function in order to actually optimize your model. Right? While this is a valid approach, it comes with the problem that uh, the raw data are easy to acquire, but the, the values or the labels to get, get these labels is extremely expensive. And um, so there's um, doing this with, the, in fact, the labeling pipeline might be not feasible in practice. And uh, so the idea is to basically go over to a, that what we call a, a self-supervised or semi-supervised approach. The, um, in, in this presentation, I will basically do this in two steps. I will first talk about um, the way how we do this um, by basically uh, utilizing a stereo system for learning the, this network. Yeah. So the idea is that we can, at training phase, have a left and right camera, and then later on can uh, remove this right camera for, for the application, which doesn't help us with uh, learning from cars that only have one camera, but um, stay tuned. I, I will come to that uh, in a few moments as well. So um, and the idea of this approach is basically we take the images from the left camera, use our monodepth network for making depth predictions. And once you know where things are in the world, you can, and you know the disparity between the left and the right camera, you can do that what we call a, a view synthesis, where we basically take the pixels and the depth and generate what the right, the, the image from the right hand uh, camera actually would look like. Right? And based on this image, this is synthesized image, we can then calculate a proxy loss and do exactly uh, the learning process that I described before. So this is the, the key idea. Um, the um, loss function is not just like the, the uh, photo, uh, photometric loss, but uh, in our case, we 
also added uh, a depth regularization for dealing with edges, for example, and uh, an occlusion regularization to deal with the occlusions from the different viewpoints of the, uh, of the two cameras. And um, there's a few other uh, aspects that we did in order to improve the performance of, of that uh, approach. So um, one observation uh, was that, uh, that the photometric loss is typically limited by the resolution. And this is why we actually uh, perform uh, a high resolution synthesization. So we basically uh, super resolve the, the disparities. And uh, you can see from this graph that uh, the, the resolution actually matters and that uh, with increasing resolution, we basically uh, re re still further reduce uh, the error overall error. And um, here are some quantitative results of this. So you will, in comparison with uh, existing approaches, where you can basically see that uh, our method outperforms uh, the, um, the uh, existing approaches on the Kitty 2015 benchmark. Um, important uh, to mention here is that we additionally do that, what we call uh, a differentiable flip augmentation. It basically flip the images uh, once in order to get additional training data, uh, which, is, uh, which is very, very simple, but uh, as you can see, highly effective. I compared to um, just um, the the, um, the approach where we do not utilize flip augmentation. Right? The three lines higher. So um, here are a few qualitative Hoffman, results. I have a question. Sorry. Yes. Um, maybe I should read it. Uh, this is from Darius. Um, say molecular molecular depth is comparable to matching of image to three D model in conventional approaches. This means accuracy depends on how close the scene model is to the current scene from the camera. Um, so, so what you are referring to is, is localization based on cameras. That's not what we are doing. We are basically directly calculating the depth from the, the images. OK. Um, all right. If I get that right. Yeah, um, let me unmute him. Maybe he might want to ask more questions. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, I was just wondering how accurate, because I couldn't make sense of the table. So what's the accuracy of the depth you're getting from the system? Yeah, that's something that I cannot report about. Uh, let me see. So, so we, I will have a few more 3D scans uh, oh. that be generated. So maybe you can get an impression from that as well. But. Uh, I cannot exactly tell you, like, uh, I don't know as to whether we did a ground truth. So this, I was not involved in this paper, but uh, I will ask the authors in, in case we, as to whether they get, did some ground truth evaluations and then okay. let you know afterwards. Uh, we have another might... question. Yeah. Uh, to just we ask, how is the accuracy of this method verified? Essentially a validation question. Um. Let me see. So, so what you basically do have, if you use like stereo matching, then you can do this from from that. Right? You can basically take a look at the loss that you're having, and then you can also use label label data, for example, for evaluating things like that or doing ground truth uh, experiments. Right? Uh, can we verify this if we have the lidar uh, data? Yeah, when once you do have LIDAR, LIDAR data, you can verify this. You also need to take into account like parallax issues and, uh, and basically the disparity. It's it's not that simple, but uh, I think on um, like if you're for certain samples, like for example, if you look at this image, if you get the surface, the back surface of the truck uh, with a LIDAR, then you can just uh, sample individual pixels in there and ask like how accurate are those pixels in, in the images. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, um, so what I can show you here, for example, is it, it also. Oh. Ooh. Oh shit. Sorry. Well, from you're muted. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So I'm back to sound again. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So everyone got muted, sorry for that. Um, yeah. So what you can see here on the, the right-hand side basically is um, the, 
second. I need to go back here and then enable the light light up. The right uh, right hand side is applications to to that what is called like tracking. And um, for me as a slam person, uh, it's particularly exciting to see that with this method, once you get the depth, you can actually do like that what we what is called called slam. You can actually try to recover trajectories um, like you do, for example, with lidars. And here you can see that. The scale is actually pretty accurate in this case, and the trajectories are also really, really close to the, the ground truth. And um, yeah, I, I promise to show you some, some videos about um, like uh, depth images. So on the top, unfortunately, they're not synchronized. Uh, on the top, you basically see the, the image sequences, and then the bottom, you see the generated LiDAR scans, which are generated purely from the um, from the images, right? and the, it's basically a different representation that uh, you see underneath uh, the the real RGB images, where you basically see the depth images, and there's nothing else but like just projecting the corresponding lidar scans into the into the image. So um, the what I showed you is basically an approach to do this from uh, like. This, like Two cameras using two cameras, and you might now argue, yeah, but your car that you showed has only one camera. And um, in fact, uh, I wouldn't come back to this if uh, I didn't have an uh, answer for for that. So what we are going to do next is we are going to basically replace the right hand side camera, the second camera, uh, and um, do this based on temporal information. And this is basically um, going from like the frame T making a prediction how the view at frame T minus one would look like, and then uh, do exactly the very same as uh, we saw before. Uh, so nothing changes apart from the fact that we go from frame T to frame T minus one. That what is lacking right now is that, that we no longer do have a baseline. So what we do there, uh, if available, we actually use uh, a post conf net uh, or um, at the velocity available, for example, from IMU to actually calculate the velocity supervision loss that we then input to the view synthesis in order to, to get the scale correctly. So here is uh, some results uh, on the dense depth for automated driving data set. Um, it is uh, from Odaiba, Japan, where you on the right hand side see the RGB values reprojected onto the dense uh, point clouds calculated from, uh, from the, the monocular image on the left hand side. And, and uh, if you wait a few seconds, you actually also see really challenging situations with uh, uh, with water on the on the asphalt. So it is actually um, partly uh, really challenging and the reflections and all kinds of uh, severe computer vision problems. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, on the chat it says. Is this data set agnostic? Can I directly run mono depth network on my own data, or does it need additional fine tuning? You can always uh, do this. Uh, I would recommend trying this out. Um, the the question is um, the uh, how good it is, and it would be interesting for us, in fact, to see how well it generalizes to um, to scenes it hasn't uh, seen before. So if you do have a challenging data set, then it would be good for us to actually know how well it performs and how well it uh, then generalizes. But I do have uh, generalization data in a second. Um, so uh, the interesting aspect of this uh, second approach is also that it uh, performs a specific operation called packing and unpacking instead of uh, uh, pooling. So here's the, the uh, packing and unpacking operations um, and um, that, that what we see is and what the, where the advantage is, so it, I hope you can see this on your home screen, is that instead of like when you do max pooling and upsampling, then you get way more blurry images than with this packing and unpacking operation. So we believe that uh, the performance increases also due to this uh, packing operation. Here are a few experimental results uh, on the Kitty data set um, where we actually, and. Um, outperform existing approaches. What is particularly interesting is that we also outperform this method over here, which is actually a supervised approach. Uh, so, um, so for this, you can actually see that there is hope that with these 
self-supervision uh, or with self-supervision we can actually also perform supervised approaches. Here are a few um, results, experimental results, uh, qualitative on the, the kidney data set. And as you can see, compared to uh, other methods, you're way better seeing uh, like sl small uh, structures like these poles over here, which are particularly hard for, uh, for these type of tasks. Further uh, interesting aspect is the, uh, the, that we are still improving with the number of, and with the increasing number of parameters. So with the better you do, we believe that this makes a better use of the network capacity compared to existing ResNet uh, approaches. You start leveling up here at that um, point already. All right, so, um, and here is what I promised the, uh, the generalization capability. So we trained on Kitty and uh, applied it on use scenes and uh, you still see a better generalization capability than with, with alternative approaches. So generalization seems to be uh, possible and uh, I hope that it also nicely generalizes to every data set uh, that you throw it at. A few anecdotal things here. So for those of you working with uh, self-driving cars, uh, People know that uh, things like cones are particularly hard for, for LIDARs um, and extremely difficult to, to classify. And here you can actually nicely see these 3D uh, structures of these individual cones in the, uh, in the depth uh, image. Um, so a few more results. Uh, this in the bottom left, you see uh, a reconstructed 3D uh, LIDAR scan. The color encoding of the points corresponds to the uh, individual image uh, frames here on the left-hand side. So we basically um, reconstruct a 3D uh, LiDAR from the, um, from the um, surround view created by the six um, individual cameras. And so the next uh, I want to talk about is um, the is real-time panoptic segmentation, um, which is a paper that has also been presented at CVPR uh, this year. The um, idea of panoptic segmentation is to basically, on top of um, like a semantic segmentation, also provide instance level in, in information for certain object classes, like cars, for example. And uh, when you look at uh, the, um, panoptic segmentation, then you see that there's been tremendous progress over the past years, and uh, the particularly with respect to the panoptic quality approaches have become substantially better. Um, what we present here in this work is uh, not only a approach that is close to the state of the art, but at the same time, is, uh, it shows a substantially better performance in, the, in terms of the frames per second it, it can progress, pr process. And this is important, in particularly when you think about automated driving, where you in the end have only limited computational resources on board a vehicle. And uh, uh, I can tell you that whenever it comes to market uh, that... Uh, the engineers will uh, scale down the um, computational performance as much as possible. And every penny counts there. So um, how does this approach work? Um, basically, we take the input image, but form a semantic segmentation, uh, generate dense bounding boxes, and uh, from that, um, calculate an, a query bounding boxes for the individual um, objects, and then uh, perform dense bounding box querying um, which then gives us a mask assignment, which we combine, sorry, which we combine with the semantic segmentation in order to get a refined uh, mask, which is then used uh, to calculate the panoptic segmentation. The entire network structure is laid out here briefly. We utilize a ResN50 um, backbone and our panoptic hat um, contains the calculation of the bounding boxes at the global levelness and then the global semantic segmentation that is briefly the, the network structure, structure that we are having. Here's a, also like the quantitative evaluation. We see like the panoptic quality. Here we are at 58.8, which is close to the top level two stage approaches um, and uh, like the best performing single stage approach. Um, what is important here is that with respect to inference time, we are substantially better on the cityscapes data set, as well as on the uh, COCO data set, um, you can see here in case of that, the suppose the validation stem. On the right-hand side, you see some qualitative results. Um, I give you a few seconds to guess uh, 
which one is ours and which one is a competitor. And uh, the solution is right here. So just in, in order to give you an idea about how difficult it is to actually tell the differences there. The, um, and I promised to you that I'm going to speak about this question of supervision. I mean, um, when you think about that, uh, you actually would have to do instance level segmentation of these uh, objects of interest in these, um, in these individual images, then you can you immediately see that this is going to be an, an, an enormous uh, amount of work. So that what would we also investigated there is to if we can release that burden and basically only provide bounding boxes at the instance level and learn from those. And uh, we call this a, a weak supervision signal. And if we do so, then we end up being only having a loss of only 5% in this case, we have 5% five, five percent points. Uh, and this is why we call this a 95% uh, strong um, um, approach in this case. So again here, like going to a weaker supervision signal is, uh, is important to reduce the burden of, of labeling. And at the same time, it's important to actually understand how much that reduces the performance of the overall approach. Finally, I want to briefly talk about uh, that what we call uh, pillar flow, which is um, which comes from the um, area of object tracking, which is also an important task for autonomous vehicles. It's a publication that will appear this year uh, at IROS in a few weeks uh, will be presented there. So the, the motivation behind this is like the majority of the stacks for auto automated driving have that what is called a detection by tracking mechanism uh, to perceive the states of objects in, in the environment. But that what you basically do is uh, you track like an object over consecutive frames in your perceptions. And from that, you infer um, the, the velocities. Um, but that requires a, a hot, like a temporal uh, geometric consistency of the object detection, which is uh, difficult and sometimes. Uh, so what we were looking into uh, was the problem as to whether we can actually generate a LIDAR-based scene motion estimator that is not dependent on the, the object detection. It's more an end-to-end -end approach. And this is actually also the key contribution here. You want to efficiently estimate 2D motion for an entire scene. And we do this based on the LIDAR-based uh, bird's eye view imagery that we generate from the, uh, the LIDAR scans. Uh, it, the approach can you know, we evaluate this on a public data set as well as on data from our uh, from our own cars. And we, I will show some data later on. And the uh, interesting aspect uh, here is also that it is uh, computationally rather effective. So how does this work, approach work? So basically what we do is we take two consecutive LiDAR scans. Um, we pass them through, the, uh, through a pillar feature network to get the bird's eye view embeddings. Um, and that is then, then used as input for uh, a feature pyramid network, uh, which is then in turn input to a flow network that finally calculates the uh, 2D bird's eye view flow. Uh, so this is basically the pipeline that we are utilizing. Um, the, like, what we are interested in is vehicles, pedestrians, et cetera, everything that uh, is dynamic and can potentially move. Um, so but, uh, that's what we labeled as a supervised approach thus far. Um, the, um, the velocity can, in fact, also be zero. Uh, all non-labeled objects, poles, and so, and so on, and background should have zero velocity. That's the assumption. Here. So the um, supervised for the as a loss function, we utilize this uh, the squared loss over here, which just goes back to to previous uh, approaches as well. So, so here you can, have five more minutes. Yes, yeah, I'll be done in five more minutes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, here are a few experimental results that um, um, we obtained on the left hand side is our approach. On the right hand side is actually the uh, ground truth. And uh, what you can see here is, which is pretty interesting, is that uh, the, the pillar flow seems to infer the geometric structure of the objects uh, even better than we have them in the ground truth. So you can actually see the rectangular uh, vehicles here on, on the left hand side. Color encodes the direction of the flow. All right, and here's another example where you can basically see um, like vehicles moving um, 
And, and again, the, these, these nice bonding boxes that our pillar flow network uh, generates. And um, a few experimental results, we uh, also compared this to a uh, detection approach where that we combine them, where we calculate that then with ICP and the binary occupancy grid uh, model. Um, and evaluate root mean square error and angular uh, average angular error. And you can see that in the majority of the cases, our approach outperforms the, the existing ones. The, um, um, we also like, looked at like, the dependency on different uh, flow networks. And it turns out that the flow network that we utilized actually uh, brings the, the best tracking results. We also, in our approach, we actually removed the, uh, the ground plane and analyzed how the influence uh, of that ground plane removal. And it turns out that um, if you do so, then uh, we increase the performance by additional 5%. So um, we furthermore looked at uh, the tracking performance of existing uh, trackers and how this uh, um, improves with our, with our network. And uh, there you can see that this, uh, our approach can even be utilized to further improve upon the existing methods uh, in different um, uh, scores that you uh, can, uh, that are typically used in, in this context. Second, um, okay. So finally, I promised also to say something about runtime. Um, here you see that um, pillar flow is pretty effective uh, compared to existing uh, high performed methods and also uh, like uh, equally effective as more simplistic methods that are right now deployed on the car. So we are actually having um, like runtime competitive approach that uh, substantially improves the performance. And here's a few uh, qualitative uh, experiments acquired with our, with our car. Uh, so here in green that what you see are the predictions uh, where the um, where the objects are going to move. Um, I will run this again and uh, and ask to to particularly look at the right hand side um, where at some point in time this reddish frame there, which is a basically bicycle appears. From that you can see that we are even able to actually nicely track uh, even more rare objects. Uh, this is again uh, data from Odaiba. Cars are driving on the left hand side, so please don't worry. Um, so, and here you can even see that in a complex intersection, uh, our, car, our car is able to nicely predict where other objects are going to move. That basically uh, concludes this uh, work about pillar flow. Um, so, which uh, I want to briefly talk at the end about. Um, that what we are planning to do in the future, being more sensitive about con temporal context, <clears throat> dealing with occlusions, and also do some input feature augmentation. And then we also have some ideas about uh, semi and self-supervised approaches to actually, uh, to actually in, improve upon that. So coming to the end, um, so what I wanted to convey to you is building truly autonomous cars requires machine learning. And there's, uh, from my perspective, no way that uh, one can build an autonomous car that does not learn. Um, I think that learned models substantially Im uh, improve performance, but come with the problem that uh, how we can actually get the labels for, for or deal without labels for in, in the learning context. The supervised learning approach does not scale and we actually need to intensively look at uh, going beyond supervised and being able to actually train from structured and unlabeled data. That's it. Thank you for coming. And I'm now open to answer your questions.